Help me out by welcoming Christopher Kemp, engineering lead at Accenture for compliance and compliance reporting and remediation with Jamf Pro. All right. Thank you, everybody. Everybody ready to get out of here and go to the party now? No. Anytime, anytime. Hopefully, the, uh, we'll get through this uh, quick enough and we'll all make it out in time. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Kemp. I'm with Accenture. I'm an engineering lead on the Mac workstation team there. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about Accenture. Um, I'm going to skip this next slide here. Um, an idea of the technology landscape at Accenture, we have about 459,000 employees, 452,000 managed workstations, uh, 12,000 of which are Macs. The rest of that is our Windows fleet. So we are about, you know, 2%, 2.5% of a very large pond. Um, there's also our mobile device footprint there. That's outside of our scope. We're strictly a workstation team. So our uh, Mac enablement program began back in 2012. Uh, it was originally spun up to support a client team working for Apple, and it's expanded over the years uh, in the digital, excuse me, digital and interactive spaces. Um, last year, we actually doubled in size from 5,000 to 10,000 machines. And of that, uh, we're also about 50% or so at this point using device enrollment. So we're kind of a hybrid uh, of our enrollment structure. So um, this is a bit of a story about an initiative from this year to improve our workstation compliance numbers. Um, it was branded uh, Protect My Tech. And um, so I want to just touch on some of the challenges that were presented by this project to us and the ways that we were able to leverage the Jamf Pro software to meet some of these challenges and a couple of things that I did to extend the functionality to try and round out that application for us. So first, let's talk about real quick how we um, determine whether a machine is compliant or not. I think it's probably pretty similar to most folks. We want to know that our uh, users are on the current OS. We want to know that all the security patches have been applied. We have our native security tools are all enabled. Uh, we have some third-party tools, of course, that we check on. We want to make sure they're all running and happy, and that our core applications are up to date. So um, the framework of this project we were presented with is modeled after an in-house application called uh, PC Checkup. It's actually been also rebranded, but that's the original, the original application which was being rewritten for this project. And, um, they uh, wanted us to produce an application experience similar to having a PC checkup on the Windows machines. So the end users could view their compliance status and take certain steps to um, fix issues as they came up. We wanted to have a master notification to let the, no the users know that there was an issue that needed their attention. A lot of times, um, Users were not aware of being out of compliance until the compliance team actually chased them down. And in an organization of our size, that's obviously a, a, a pretty big task. So some people might go out of compliance for quite some time before they actually got caught and had to go and look at their issues. So we want to get in front of it by having uh, a notification system. We want to automate the remediation for these problems whenever possible, give them a simple interface where they can click on something and get the information that they need, or perhaps run an automated fix to take care of whatever this issue is. And whenever that's not possible, we want to pre-populate uh, help desk tickets. Uh, we're using ServiceNow these days. And so we uh, provide a mechanism for them to get these tickets in that are targeted to whatever issue uh, it, they're having currently. So when I initially considered these things, I thought about what we had to work with. Uh, they they uh, were under the assumption that we would uh, write a new app that could be deployed out. But in thinking about what we had available in Jamf Pro, I envisioned something like this, which is our Protect My Tech panel in self-service. So there was that. <laughs> So it gives us uh, an application with, uh, gives us the, the uh, explicit feedback 
and the users can run their automation in a place that they're already familiar with because we've already had self-service out for some time and we get to, uh, we've been providing these tools for the users to fix this and that. So this is basically a unifying of that whole experience. Um, that is probably the primary reason why we went this way instead of a standalone app. Um, it fits into our current ecosystem. Our, our users are already well familiar with it. You know, we deliver tools, we deliver software, and plus we want to drive them to self-service rather than take them away from it with a third-party application. Also, Jamf Pro is actually providing most of that compliance data already. So by using self-service, we get to leverage that data in place rather than having to come up with another way to read that data and interpret it. The um, mechanisms for end-user feedback and self-remediation, of course, are already there. We can show them particular policy faces, and we have the buttons to run uh, actions. And we can easily customize these actions and maintain them over time. If we had to go to a third-party developer, for instance, then uh, we would have to call them back when it was time to add a compliance metric, for instance. Pardon me, I'm going to get some water here. The, um, in this case, by doing it this way, we can deploy a new compliance metric or make an adjustment the same day, have it in the field, and immediately get feedback. So, I'm going to look at the key components of what makes up that panel. Uh, we've got um, policies and notifications. Uh, we've got smart groups that are doing the policy scoping. These are basic, very basic smart groups that are built around simple yes no conditionals. So uh, they're not complex at all. Um, we are using uh, the patch reporting titles for some application versioning information. And we are doing uh, some additional scripting and extension attributes. And these are all points we want to get into a little bit deeper as we go on here. So first, I want to talk about the at-a-glance display. We want something that the user can just look at, they know what they're seeing, easy feedback, right? So to do this, I decided to go with a simple icon set. So we have your basic stoplight colors. Green and red are really the basic two compliant, non-compliant states that we have. I added the yellow one to um, cover states that are not, that don't fit into that binary definition of compliant and non-compliant, sort of a wild card. And the blue one was added a little bit later because we created a dedicated help desk ticket icon. Some of these have a targeted ticket, but some of them don't. Um, if you know about uh, using policies in self-service, basically you get one action. So. Um, if we had try to run an auto remediation and it fails, they're going to have to open a ticket anyway. So this was just a sort of a catch-all. If you still need help, click on the blue icon button. So I want to take a close, real close look at these just a second. The green one, it's a display-only policy. There are no actions associated with it at all. Um, I've got simple text on the buttons, OK. You can always pass the more detailed information, of course, with the icon window. But the main aim was this just to be very simple at a glance. I don't have to think about it. I'm okay, right? Same thing here. Be a simple at a glance. There's something um, wrong with the machine. There are a couple of, a couple of details here. Um, you'll notice the exclamation point at the beginning of the title. The reason for that is because that self-service will sort your policies according to display title, according to ASCII text order. So this allows me to take the red icons and push them to the front of the line. So that whenever, no matter how many icons I may have on a, on a page, I think we're currently about 16 or 17 total, um, the users never have to scroll down. If they have a problem, it comes to the top and they see it right away. And they can just assume if they, all they see is green, they're fine. The button text changes. Um, like I said, we have two things we're gonna do. We're either gonna run an auto fix or we're gonna open a ticket. So uh, the button text will change according to whichever one of these actions we have assigned. Of course, we have the information button for uh, more detailed information about what their problem is. 
The yellow icon, like I said, was a wild card. This can be a display or an actionable item. And if it's actionable, you should stick that uh, exclamation point there so that it jumps up to the head of the line. They know it's important. Um, some ideas about why this might be used, for instance, like um, regenerating a file vault key, which is definitely something you want them to do. You want them to you know, keep, fix this problem, but it's not something we're going to ding you for compliance. You know, file vault is going to be on or off, but your key is a separate matter. So that's, that's, that for us is a, what we're doing for an actionable condition. There's also a display condition we have. Uh, which you see here, actually, uh, Microsoft Excel listed as a pre-release version. The, um, the thing about using the patch versioning libraries is that they are specifically curated by Jamf, and they are production releases only. So if you have people on the insider channels who have the early versions, they're going to come up as an unknown. So that's what this is catching. This is telling me that this person has a pre-release version of Microsoft Excel. And so we're not calling them non-compliant. You know, we have a limited group of people who do the pre-release testing. We're not going to ding them for that, but it's just to alert them that they don't fall into the regular scope. And then finally, there's our little help desk ticket. Um, the only thing of note particularly here is that there's a white space that you wouldn't normally see unless I told you. <laughs> in front of the help desk ticket. Again, that's that ASCII text sorting. That's to pin it to position one ahead of the exclamation point so that it's always in that same position. And let's see. So we're going to look at the, uh, OK, we're going to look at the a breakdown of some of the policy windows here. OK, and this is uh, one for file vault encryption. I'm just going to walk through and show you what the things that I've set for uh, an example of, of these policies here. Um, we have, of course, the, the display name of the policy. Uh, I used the um, naming convention of calling them red, green, and yellow just for simplicity's sake. It actually makes it easier to sort through if you have a lot of policies. We have between two and 300 policies, I think, in our, in our JSS currently, so it helps to target in if I just search for red policies. <laughs> right. uh, the number is optional. I was actually just trying that on at first. I didn't actually number them all, but it's just stuck in that point. Policies enabled, you see. Um, it is assigned to the category protect my tech. That is uh, where it's going to live on the panel. Um, for Has everybody in here uh, configured a self-service? Understand the categories? Anybody not understand that? It's pretty obvious. So you assign it a category. Only these icons are going to go in the protect my tech category. It's assigned there. There are no triggers assigned because it's strictly a self-service policy. So we'll move on to the next page there. Uh, the smart group scoping. I've got uh, compliance, file vault, missing encryption. is going to see this red policy. I've also taken the extra step of excluding the uh, file vault OK, encryption OK group, just to try and be extra sure that those uh, we don't get a double icon. It's Probably a bit of overkill because the scoping should really do it, but it's figured it was better safe than confusing other people. And uh, just ignore the PMT pending privacy group. That is uh, uh, just a privacy review that's being done by uh, currently Germany, actually, is uh, the only review that we have left. So that's going to go away as soon as we get their final approval. Okay. So self service, we have, of course, checked. Uh, makes policy available in self-service. You can see the uh, display name there with the uh, extra exclamation point in front of it. Um, we've got the button name, help. If you happen to have two slots here, make sure that they line up so you don't get button text uh, changing on you when someone actually runs the auto remediation. And um, I've got a bit of a description in there saying file vault uh, encryption appears to be not configured properly. In this case, it's a help desk issue, so it just says click help button to uh, issue a support ticket. And there's our lovely red icon. Um, one thing you want to do if you're configuring this um, to make this easier is to upload your icons first. Just set up a dummy policy and do this. I'm going to touch on this a little bit later. I have some scripts that help create these policies, 
And if you have the icon IDs, you need that for the uh, scripts, you can create them all at once rather than going through and creating them individually. And uh, there are no categories assigned below except for the default. That's an option, you know, but we don't want to necessarily see it anywhere else. And for user interaction, now this one doesn't actually have it because it's a help desk ticket. But in actionable items, I am actually putting the start and complete messages in here to let the users know that we're trying to do something on their machine, particularly because we have to run a recon after whatever we do to update this and change the policy scope to get them the correct icon back. So um, you'll see, we'll actually see that in action shortly. And, oh, and okay, for this one, like I said, was the help desk ticket. This is, we're just calling a script there, uh, the create snow ticket, which is a script I wrote. We basically, just uh, about our implementation, we have a custom URL in uh, service now that will take us to the help desk ticket. They set us up with some error codes in a small matrix. So I'm just passing the app ID and error code uh, relevant to this particular problem in the fields, uh, the first two fields there. And so the script is just gonna read those in and interpret that and then pre-populate the correct information in the ticket. So, uh, like I said, the smart groups that we're using for scoping, um, green and red are meant to be opposing yes or no conditions. You know, am I encrypted? Am I not encrypted? Is my firewall on? Is it off? Just really basic stuff. Um, the yellow conditions, we want to keep them simple, but we want them to be independent usually. Uh, like I said, it's a wild card. Whatever fits for you is fine. But... Um, Again, just trying to keep them simple. The simpler they are, the less likely they are to misfire and give you, give you trouble later on. And we're building the criteria of these from existing data that we have. Some of these are patch title versioning, and some of them are special extension attributes, like I mentioned before. A uh, quick look at the smart groups window. Here we have uh, the patch reporting for that Microsoft Excel 2016. The reason I leverage patch reporting for this stuff is because you get that greater than or equal to operator. And that is actually pretty handy if you're going to keep that from firing whenever there's a new version released. For Microsoft, um, we, um, we don't require that you be on the latest one. Being a rev or two back, that's okay. Also, when the new version comes out and the library is updated, we don't set off alarm bells to everybody saying, oh, all of a sudden you're non-compliant for uh, Microsoft because the new version's out. We are already addressing this with uh, auto updates anyway. So they'll get updated. This just keeps them happy. As, as long as, at this point, we know if, if this pops up for them with the Microsoft applications, they've fallen way behind. Something is wrong with their auto update probably and they may need some attention. Uh, let's see, that's the red group right there. So less than whatever the current version is. And I'm also excluding that unknown version, like I said, so that I can accommodate my yellow group, which is there, just if it's unknown version. We are assuming that that means that they are on Insider. I, I suppose it's within the realm of possibility that it could be on a really stupid old version, 2011, that they moved into the wrong place. But we're assuming that that's not the case. <laughs> Most likely, they're on the Insider channel. So, um, after all of that, this is a little video of the things in action. What you can see here is a panel where there is an app missing. It's called reportphishing.app. It's an internal app. Again, we have to report uh, external phishing emails to the security department. Um, you can also see the uh, Insider version icons there. So, um, First thing we're going to do, the user comes up, they see this, they're going to click fix. See it's executing, you're going to see the notification pop up in the upper right hand corner. That's letting them know that we are about to do something. We're going to reinstall this application on their machine. You'll actually see the dock blink a couple of times as we put that in and add the dock item. Down in the right side there you see the little fish with the question mark on it. And then that recon, recon has to run. So I'm going to time lapse that a bit for you. You don't have to wait for that. There's our, our 
item finish notification, asking them to refresh the panel. And they can go up here to the view menu and select reload my Accenture Mac. And we'll check back in and gather the status. And their panel is back to normal. So we have a pretty cool little UI for the people to see their status and for them to do something with it. You know, we have the smart groups going on. We're leveraging some of our inventory data and track, tracking app versions. We still have a few holes in this thing. So what are we missing? We're missing uh, patch reporting for non-curated titles. Again, we're, we're kind of limited to what Jamf has given us in their library. So we have some other things that are outside that library we want to check on. Um, initially, I addressed this with Bryson Terrell's uh, patch server project, his community patch server. Uh, I know uh, you may have seen that the, there's also a, a slightly more full version of a patch server available uh, through the integration store, I believe. Um, this is good if you, if you have to track some... Here, my thinking on this is this. If you have an odd title, you might want to take a look at the community patch server project out there. It's uh, open source. It's a little wild west, but it's very cool. And uh, like I said, if you only have a little bit, it may not be worth it to spin up your own server. If you have a lot of stuff, I would recommend actually taking the trouble to spin up the server and look at this project and put that in there. Now, I will say, I, this is a very cool set of projects. However, I did not actually end up using this for the purpose that we had. Uh, and that is because uh, one of the security items that we have is uh, tracking Adobe Flash Player app, the standalone debugging version for Adobe Flash. And it turns out that that can live in many, many places. So patch uh, reporting does not currently support that, apparently. Um, so I had to go uh, onto a scripted model. And um, with that, we'll get into the scripting stuff a little bit here. I will say, I've, I've used Jamf Pro for probably nine years now, um, for about three and a half here at Accenture, and before that I was with CNN, I did uh, work with them. And I love the fact that we can extend Jamf Pro in these ways, that we can mold it and you know, bend it to the stuff that we need. I think that's really great. So, um, first thing I want to talk about is the alerter notification real quick. This is an open source project. Um, I am not going to mangle these guys' names, but it's out there on, on GitHub, and actually at the end of the presentation, I have a couple of links. This, the link to this particular project is there. One of the reasons I really like this is um, the fact that it auto-populates uh, that icon. It does a little thing where you can um, sort of fake out what app is calling that notification. So I tell it that self-service is calling it, and it automatically puts out our self-service branded uh, icon, which is pretty cool. You might have noticed that the start-stop notifications are not branded yet. However, I did raise that up with the Jam product team this week. Hopefully, they will take that under advisement and see if we can get that added, too. And uh, the later and open buttons there, there's a couple buttons. You can tie actions to those. The later just dismisses the, the thing. And open, I have it set to go ahead and, and open up uh, self-service for the user so that they can go ahead and take action on their issue. So like I said, Adobe Flash Player .app required a scripted, ver uh, scripted solution. So I basically, I created a script that uh, searches the Applications folder and the Adobe-specific folders in Applications for Flash Player .app. It checks the versioning by, by checking the info.plist in each app. And if anything is found to be not current, then it sends, uh, it flags the EA uh, flags the machine with using the EA, so to pardon me to trigger the uh, to trigger the smart group. Um, at this point, we don't care how many versions are good or bad, right? We just want to, We know that one of them's bad. That's all we need to know right now. There's a companion remediation script for this, which I have, um, which does the same search, and then it generates a list. It pops open a text file, shows the exact path of each version of application it found, what version it is, and it also offers to open uh, a job aid, which takes them to the download um, site where they can download the current version of the player 
or they have the option to delete it if they really don't care about it and never use it, which is usually why it ends up being out of, out of compliance. So the semantic health check. This was a fun little project. Are there any other semantic users there? So y'all might know, step 14 took away the ability to uh, query the client directly. Um, hopefully they will see the, <laughs> the error of their ways on that one at some point. But um, in the meantime, we wanted to know some things about the client. So I created a script also that checks these eight um, points. Is CEP installed? Are the last scan and the virus definitions up to date within 14 days for us? Uh, are all the KECs loaded? And does the Silink file exist? For those of you all that don't know, the Silink file is just the server's definition file tells it where our CEPM server lives. So um, each of these points is evaluated on this score. That's a lot to squeeze into a simple yes, no extension attribute, right? So each of these is evaluated on this score, um, and then the final score is turned into a binary number, which gives you that's the output of the EA itself. And what that string means is each one of those points represents a one or a zero. If it's okay, it's a one. If it's not okay, it's a zero. So if my last scan is older than 14 days, my string is gonna be one, zero, one, 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 one. If uh, my kecks are not loaded, those uh, four, I guess, uh, digits, five, six, and seven are all gonna be zeros. So not only does it put it into a nice sort of binary format, we can check, is it all ones or not? But then we can also use that to sort of do a little quick diagnosis and maybe try and figure out what's going on with the client. And then finally, the, uh, well, no, it's just finally, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think this is finally. Um, ServiceNow ticketing, um, like I said, they created the Snow Ticket Shell script. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. The uh, app ID and the error code that you saw that I defined in the policy come in as $4 and $5. Um, I'm pulling the host name out so that I can identify that machine. I don't know if that's a problem for you guys, but we have a very large support desk, and they very often don't remember to give us the name of the machine when they report a problem. Often enough that you know, this is a big help to be able to, to just pull that and automatically include that in the ticket. So the snow URL is the, that's the custom URL that they gave us. It's not literally blah, 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 but you get the point. And um, at the bottom, that's the command that basically runs the whole thing. It's open in safari.app, and I just add all those variables together to give us our pre-populated ticket. So, extending some more. There is actually a little bit more here. Um, we are leveraging the classic API quite a bit. And in this particular case, for some of these tools, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Chris LaSalle at Pixar, uh, also Arika Hayes, um, for providing the Ruby GSS, another open source component. I highly recommend this if you're gonna get heavily into the API because it is just is so much nicer, at least for me, <laughs> to be able to write in Ruby. Um, and the function, I've been able to get really amazing functionality with fairly simple scripts, actually. So thank you, Chris. I don't know if he's actually here. He said he was coming, but thank you very much for that. Um, we have next here. Oh, okay. So uh, just a couple of the scripts I have created here. Um, let me preface that by saying, um, with this project, we just... Uh, decided to open source some of this stuff as well. So we have created uh, a new Accenture Mac enablement GitHub repository. Um, that URL will be uh, in the collection of URLs at the end. And these are just a couple of the scripts that I developed to create and maintain this stuff. So um, creating the policies from the list. This, um, you uh, list your compliance points out it's just naming, so you know, simple names are fine. You want to say, I want to check file vault, I want to check the firewall, I want to check. Um, uh, well, anything, just make a simple text list and feed it to this script, and it will create the bones of the policies. It doesn't create them completely because you have to go in and hand tool some of this stuff, but it will make um, a set of green and red and yellow policies for each item on the list. 
Um, you can assign the uh, category, so they all end up ready to go into the panel. You can assign the app IDs. If you pull those three app IDs, uh, I mean, sorry, icon IDs, pull those three icon IDs out of your JSS after you've uploaded those initial uh, icons, drop them into the script, and uh, they'll all have the icon automatically assigned for you. They come in uh, disabled, so it won't you know, freak your users out and jump up and do things. And then, of course, your uh, Jamf Pro server name credentials. Um, next up is, right, creating the smart groups. A similar thing, it creates a command, companion smart groups for the patch title IDs in this case. And it makes those green and red smart groups for scoping. So if you want to do uh, Microsoft Office, for example, that's a minimum of 10 smart groups. So um, it really helps to have this thing to just spit those out, get those in place again. Uh, again, that's pretty much the same hard-coded values, um, the server name credentials. Oh, level, right. Um, so it, we allow n minus two revs of Office. So I have put that two in there, and it will automatically read whatever the current patch title is, drop down two numbers, and use that for the acceptable version level. And group name format is optional. Uh, if you don't like the way I wrote them, you can change them. But um, they're kind of hard-coded in there right now to just be um, current or not current. So Microsoft, Excel, current, et cetera. And let's see. We uh, have the patch title smart group updater. So the, the downside of creating all of this stuff in there is that maintaining it can be a big job, because it's a lot of smart groups and things. So I created this script to update those titles automatically. So here you get a list of your patch title IDs. Okay? Um, the simplest way to do this is uh, to just pull up the patch title and look in the URL, and the ID number is in the URL. Or you can pull it from MySQL. If you're handy with MySQL, you can pull it out of the tables. Um, this is kind of a one and done thing, though. You, uh, put, you, you just list those in there. It's put into an array. Uh, you put in your acceptable level of revisions. Um, I guess I'm assuming that those wouldn't change. Maybe we could look at that. Um, and your server name and credentials. You run this thing, and it will automatically go out and check the JSS by the API. And if the version number has changed, it'll update all the groups for you. So rather than clicking through 10 Microsoft groups, you run this thing, it takes about 30 seconds, and it's done. You could actually even put this on a scheduled job and ignore it. So, and this is a beginning project for us. You know, we just spun this up recently. Uh, this was, like I said, this was this year's project for me. Um, I'm, I'm still working on it. Uh, we're going to hopefully get some additional checks built. Uh, we'd like to see some feedback coming from some other systems. Granted, there are a few holes in this in that there are a few things that are reported for compliance that we cannot see in the JAMP server. For instance, going back to the SEPM, we can check the local client health, but I can't tell if it's checking into the SEPM correctly. So we hope to be able to build some sort of mechanism to get that feedback and maybe bring it into JAMP and um, populate the panel with some additional checks that way. We're also looking into webhooks to provide the data back to the compliance system. It's uh, a redesign of that. Uh, currently, it's just a straight database read. I think if you uh, are in that position, you know that can be a little tricky. Um, but the webhooks are going to be, I think, a really great solution to just deliver straight up computer record information in, and give it um, more real time updating rather than a scheduled daily read and sort of parsing that stuff out. So just to recap real quick, we, you know, I told you the story of our little project here, of the need that we had for reporting compliance issues, how I use self-service to uh, build out most of that, and some things I did for scripting and add-on capabilities. So I want to say a real quick shout out to my team, Brandon Peek, who's over there <laughs> sitting in the audience, Mike Sampsonberg, Chad Proctor, Kayla Green, and Hafizula Chatur. These guys uh, really provided me with all the cover I needed to build this thing this year. And uh, they're a great bunch of folks to work with. I'm really happy to be part of this team.
So if anybody has any questions about this, I think we still have some time. Yeah, a little bit of time. See a couple guys come down. Hey. Hi. So we do a few policies like this, with, which toggle mm -hmm. one way or another, and you sort of, it's based on the recon. And the problem we have, and maybe you see the same thing, is um, that uh, the policy says done, but actually that's when the recon happens, not, not before it says done. So there can be a delay. Hmm. And uh, it can be, maybe under some circumstances, a minute or two. And the users do their refresh, but it still says it's not compliant, and they click again, and it, then you maybe get an error or something. It's quite confusing. So are you using the inbuilt update inventory component in a policy to do that? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. But the, the way Jamf to, works is the uh -huh. recon runs when it says done. And you know, uh, I have to look at that. Yeah. I think that's, that I may be scripting those mm. um, because, of, because of that delay. And if you in, can insert it into the command to, to do the recon, that, then you, it'll happen a little more timely. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. I have to double check now because I'm sorry, I don't remember if I put it individually into the fixes or if it's simply in the, um, the run a command portion of it. We did a lot of those that way where we just run things and put Jamfreecon in the run a command portion of it. First off, I, I love what you've done. This is fantastic. It's a, a really neat idea. Uh, secondly, to that gentleman's point, uh, you are correct. Running the recon command uh, as a script item versus leveraging the policy will actually yeah. report that inventory much faster uh, than waiting for the jam check-in process. Uh, so that'll make sure your cell service is updated. So that answers that question. Uh, my question is actually, why cell service? Why not just let Jamf do it behind the scenes and send you a report mm -hmm. for reporting purposes? Why put the onus on the user? Why not just have it automated? Well, a lot of these things were automated. Um, in some cases, I think the big thing is when the automation fails. Um, with certain things um, like uh, encryption, we enforce encryption at uh, the machine deployment. You know, we have a computer level profile that lays it down and it's, just, it's not optional. But if that's broken, then that lets them see, you know, and give us the feedback. Hopefully it drives them to us. I think that's part of it, you know. Hmm. Um, we, we, we really rely a lot on automation. You know, I mean, these things are, uh, an additional thing to try and get people to uh, give people a tool to come forward. Okay. But you know, I mean, it's certainly a fair point. It's certainly a fair point to uh, to uh, take care of those things in the background as much as possible. Thank you. My hope is that they would never see these icons, actually. But so, in order, <coughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so, in order to make sure that this is always up to date. How often are your computers checking, uh, updating inventory? Are, well, is it like constant? No, actually, we're uh, we're just doing a daily inventory report or the normal times. Um, so there's I, no concern that like they'll go 24 hours out of compliant and you'll have no idea because they haven't updated inventory. They wouldn't yet? go more than 24 I, unless they're offline, um, and that's I think that's close enough. Really, uh, as opposed to, like I said, you know, we're a very large organization, and people might not know the difference, and they would go on for months before they got caught up, because with you know almost a half a million computers for the team that has to chase that down, they don't do it all at once. You know, they do it in waves. So, um, it, you know, I think it adds a little immediacy to that. Yeah, some you is could, better than and it's also Thank also you. if you run too many recons, it tends to load up the database a lot. It does. And That's why I was yeah curious. So it's it, it's quite enough <laughs> for us to do it that way. I think we'd have probably other problems if we tried to do it Thank a you. lot more frequently. Sure, sure. Hi, and you might have uh, touched on this before, but I'm here with the green ones. Why the need to let them know that they're complying with the green ones? Why not just not include green? Yeah, you know, it's, it, that's a fair question. It's, uh, I guess it's a confidence thing. It's a way to look at it and say, you know, here are these things that are all okay. Um, we had previously, you know, we'd deploy tools and we'd scope them so that they would appear and disappear. And while that, I think that's a valid uh, way to do it, and we, we still do a lot of that, 
but I think for the end user too, the, who are not really thinking in those, those terms, you know, I think it may be helpful to just see that, that uh, extra thing that says, I'm okay, you know. Do you Plus, provide uh, any? It, is, uh, it was a project requirement for that matter too. Uh, so it was an effort to replicate what they were seeing in this other application. Do you provide information when they click the OK button? And if so, what? Um, I don't. Or what happens? Or it runs a dead policy. It doesn't really do anything. Does, okay. You could though. You know, um, I actually toyed with the idea just for just for the humor of it to put the start stop notification that says your machine's fine. You don't have to click that. You know. <laughs> but all it does is just really just it, it, technically it runs a policy, but the policy doesn't do anything. Thank you. So, sure. Anything else? Let me um, put up the uh, reference URLs. There we go. So the Mac, oh, hello, go back, hello. There we go, okay. Uh, the Mac enablement GitHub there. At the top, there's the link for Alerter, that little project, uh, the, to the Ruby JSS, and the patch server for Jamf Pro. Yes, in the marketplace jamf.com link. And um, just to, about our GitHub, like I said, this is brand new. We just created it around this project, but our hope is that we're going to add more and more little tools, some EAs, some scripts. So uh, please come back and check on it uh, as time goes on. I have a couple of scripts, actually, I need to still sanitize and put up there, but the ones I went over here should all be available today. And uh, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Enjoy the party.